encryption against mass surveillance uh, by Mihir Bilari, Kenny Patterson, and Phil Rogaway. And impatient Kenny is going, I guess, to give the talk. Thank you very much, Evgeny. So I hope the talk isn't a disappointment after all of that buildup. Um, so we've been learning a lot from Snowden. And one of the things that we've learned is that mass surveillance of internet traffic, your internet traffic, is taking place right now all over the world. Um, you can look up on all of the news sites. You can find all of the code names for the programs. The GCHQ program was actually called Mastering the Internet, MTI, which is a bit of a giveaway. Okay? There are all kinds of other names for other programs. There's PRISM. I don't remember all of the names right now, but this is happening. Unfortunately, just using encryption to protect your traffic is not enough to protect against mass surveillance. For example, we've seen uh, the furore around the insertion of a backdoor or the potential insertion of a backdoor into the dual elliptic curve generator standardized by NIST. There's a paper appearing this week at Usenix Security showing that that generator is actually quite widespread in software. Um, there's a possibility of extracting keys from servers by legal means or by penetrating the servers themselves. And once you have the server key in a protocol like TLS, if you're not using forward security, you can decrypt the traffic. There's active attacks on the public key infrastructure that underpins protocols like TLS, where you forge certificates and fool a, a naive browser into accepting a certificate for a website uh, containing a public key, which is not actually the correct public key. There's the potential for backdoors in cryptographic software. And there are good examples of this uh, even in, in open source software in things like IPsec implementations from five, 10 years ago, exploiting things like timing attacks, covert channels, and so on. And there are other means as yet unknown. So if you didn't know already, crypto is politics. And we're in the middle of that. And the IACR, through its what I'm calling the Copenhagen resolution, um, those of you who are at Eurocrypt in May this year would have been witness to this uh, resolution being passed by the IACR unanimously at the members meeting. The membership of the IACR repudiates mass surveillance and the undermining of cryptographic solutions and standards. Population-wide surveillance threatens democracy and human dignity. We call for expediting research and deployment of effective techniques to protect personal privacy against governmental and corporate overreach. That's where we are right now. And this paper is very much firing the first salvo in the fight back against mass surveillance technologies that are being used against us. It's only the first step. And what the question that we're answering in this paper as is, going back to this slide, what are these other means as yet unknown that might be being used to survey us? And what can we do to protect against them? Our focus here is actually quite narrow, but we've chosen it very carefully. Our focus is on a particular class of attacks that we call algorithm substitution attacks, or ASAs, against symmetric encryption. Symmetric encryption, many of you might consider it to be rather a dull topic. It's all done, right? But symmetric encryption is the basic building block for secure channels. And secure channels are what we use every day for communicating or attempting to communicate securely on the, on the internet using protocols like IPsec, TLS, SSH, and so on. And it is the target of mass surveillance on encrypted traffic on the, on the internet. So symmetric encryption is the thing to look at because it's so fundamental to building secure channels. The basic idea of an algorithm substitution attack is the following. We assume there's an adversary, which we're calling here Big Brother, advisedly. Big Brother is able to subvert the cryptographic software running on your computer. So it's able to replace your encryption algorithm E with a subverted algorithm E tilde. The ciphertexts that are generated by these two encryption algorithms look just the same to an ordinary user. However, the ciphertexts that are generated by the subverted algorithm E tilde leak everything to Big Brother. In particular, they might leak the encryption key or the messages. Uh, in, in, a, in an ideal attack from Big Brother's perspective, he would be easily able to recover the key, the encryption key, from the subverted ciphertext and thereafter decrypt everything. So ASAs are not completely new. They have been explored previously. We regard them as being a realistic threat vector for attempting to mount mass surveillance attacks against internet traffic. There's some very interesting previous work under the banner of kleptography by Young and Jung in the 90s and also into the 2000s. And there's also a very interesting paper from 2003 by Go et al, who studied this kind of attack against the SSL TLS protocol in particular. So they're not completely new, but we feel in the light of what we've been learning from Snowden, they deserve to be much more widely explored and formalized. 
So here's a little bit more detail on the setting for algorithm substitution attacks. Here's normal operation of a symmetric encryption scheme. We have two users trying to communicate securely. They're using a symmetric encryption algorithm E, which has a key K. They're trying to transmit a message M with associated data A. So here we're thinking of the uh, AEAD setting. And we're thinking of stateful randomized encryption schemes. And here sigma represents the state for the encryption. And tau represents the state for decryption. So this is completely normal operation of the scheme. Everything's good. And in this case, the big brother adversary, who is assumed in all of our work to be a passive adversary, he wants to be unobservable or unnoticed. Um, he doesn't know the encryption key K, and he actually he's not able to learn anything if our encryption scheme is good. OK, so this is normal operation. This is the ideal world, if you like. And now here is the real world of subverted operation. Here's the possibility. So now still the two parties are trying to communicate with each other securely. But now we have NSA inside for the encryption algorithm. The encryption algorithm has been subverted. And now we are running the E tilde algorithm, which is equipped with a key, a special key K tilde, which you can think of as kind of a master secret, which is embedded in every copy of the software that's distributed on the internet. Okay? This algorithm also has access to the normal encryption key, and so on and so forth, and generates ciphertext. Those are transmitted across the channel. We make the assumption that the receiver is able to decrypt these uh, subverted ciphertexts using the normal decryption algorithm. This is a, a basic form of uh, preventing detection of this kind of subversion. So we assume this is going to be the case. And now Big Brother, uh, we call this condition decryptability. It becomes important later on. And now Big Brother, who is in, not in possession of the, the encryption key K, but is in possession of the subverted master key K tilde, is able, using an alternative decryption algorithm, D tilde, to recover the message or recover the key, do something bad to the security of our crypto system. So this is the setting for ASAs against SE. And here are our contributions in brief. So what we're going to do in this paper, or what we do in this paper, is we give formal definitions for uh, symmetric encryption secure against um, ASAs, algorithm substitution attacks. And we do this using two distinct adversaries. They're somehow jewels of each other. We have a detection adversary, and this models a normal user who holds the normal encryption key K, but not the subverted key K tilde, and who's trying to detect if an ASA is underway. Then we have the surveillance adversary, which models Big Brother, in possession of the subverted key K tilde, but not the normal encryption key, the passive surveillance adversary, who wants to read all of the user's traffic. And we define security against algorithm substitution attacks, and I'll do it formally in a moment, as being the property that either a detection adversary always trivially exceeds, sorry, succeeds, meaning that you can detect the subversion is underway, or the surveillance adversary miserably fails. And by miserably fails, we'll, we'll, we'll characterize that as an indistinguishability property, as in normal security games. Unfortunately, we have a negative result. We show that any randomized stateless symmetric encryption scheme is vulnerable to an algorithm substitution attack, which actually recovers the encryption key and therefore renders all security useless. So it allows Big Brother to efficiently recover the encryption keys. We show that deployed schemes are vulnerable to this kind of attack. I won't talk about that today. It's in the appendix to the full version of the paper. We also, on the positive side, provide practical constructions for symmetric encryption schemes that are secure against this kind of attack. And they're stateful in both encryption and decryption, which is a slightly unusual property to have. And finally, we highlight what we call the danger of choice in protocol design. So those are our contributions. What I'm going to focus on next is how to formally model algorithm substitution attacks. And we do this in terms of two games. The first game is the detection security game. Here, the detection adversary is modeling the ordinary user, you, who is in possession of an encryption key or a set of encryption keys, but not the subverted master secret K tilde, and who's trying to detect if one of these attacks is underway. So here's our, here's our lowly user, you. He has access to a key oracle, so he sends some kind of identifying string, an integer in this case, to the key oracle. A random encryption key is generated and is given back to the user. So the user is in possession of all of the encryption keys. And what this essentially means is that we're in the multi-user setting, where we're looking at many users simultaneously who are being subverted by Big Brother. You also gets to make encryption queries. He gets to specify a message, associated data, and the key index that he wants this message to be encrypted under. 
And we're in one of two worlds. In the B equals one world, the real world, if you like, um, the normal encryption algorithm is used, and a ciphertext is generated. In the B equals zero world, the subverted encryption algorithm is used, and the ciphertext is returned to the user. And these algorithms are stateful in the usual way, and they, use, they have associated data. And so the ciphertext is returned to the user, and after many calls to this uh, encryption oracle and to the key oracle, the user is then required to output a bit B prime, and he, he is said to win if, if, if B prime is equal to B, where B is a random bit chosen at the start of the security game. Okay? And so security here would mean um, that the subversion by E tilde cannot be detected by the ordinary user U. This is a bad property from our perspective. The surveillance security game looks very similar. Now we're modeling Big Brother, who's in possession of K tilde, the master key of the scheme, but not any of the uh, encryption keys. And, and, and in this setting, the way we formally model this is by saying also that the surveillance adversary is trying to detect if an ESA is underway. Because if the surveillance adversary can't detect if an ESA is underway, then he can't tell whether the real or the, or the subverted algorithm is being used. So you could conceptually switch to using the real algorithm, and then the ciphertext won't leak anything uh, that they don't already leak if, if the scheme is in CPA secure. So this is a weaker security property than being able to read all users' traffic, but we're going to try to prove positive security results. So this is the kind of definition that we want at this point. Okay, so um, in this setting, now we have Big Brother. Now he's equipped with the, the master key, K tilde. He has access to a key oracle, which sets up the keys, but does not return them to the adversary. So Big Brother doesn't know the individual encryption keys. Again, he has access to an encryption oracle, which either returns real or subverted ciphertext, C, and his job is to output a bit B prime, as before. And so just to, to reiterate, here we're modeling this as an indistinguishability property, but it captures what we want for positive security results about schemes not being able to be surveyed, okay? For preventing mass surveillance. Okay, so I said all this already, and so security against ASAs basically means that for all possible subversions E tilde of our encryption algorithm, either there is a detection adversary with high advantage, or all surveillance adversaries, BB, have negligible advantage. So that's the way the thing is quantified. And this is a slightly unusual quantification in, in, in security definitions. What we're saying here is that the security for one encryption scheme means that a different type of encryption scheme does not exist, okay? If there's a, a good algorithm E, then there's no E tilde with, with meeting the security definition. So that's the formal modeling of security against ASAs. Let me know, show, now show you why all randomized stateless encryption schemes are subvertible according to this definition. It's a very simple idea um, which enables us to recover the encryption key. So what we do is we pick a pseudo-random function f um, which has k tilde as, uh, as its key. And in order to leak the jth bit of the key k, what we now do is repeatedly encrypt using the fact that our, uh, using the scheme E, using the fact that it's randomized and has sufficiently big randomness space until we hit a value C, a ciphertext C, such that this predicate holds. The PRF evaluated at C on index J gives us the key bit K of J. And of course, now, Big Brother being equipped with K tilde, passively observing the ciphertext is able to recover the bit K of J because he knows the key K tilde. On the other hand, the ordinary users, they don't know K tilde, these ciphertexts just look normal. There's some work required to prove that, um, but then it means he cannot distinguish C from, not, from normal ciphertext. So this attack is undetectable. You need to do a little bit of extra work to deal with different indices J and to cope with different keys KI in the multi-user setting, but this is the fundamental, the basic idea to make this attack work. And the attacks also extend to the stateful setting. Okay, so given that, how are we going to defeat ASAs? How are we going to come up with constructions that avoid this kind of attack? Well, we know that stateless deterministic schemes can't achieve semantic security, but now randomized schemes are bad which is very much counter to the received wisdom in the community about how to build secure encryption schemes. You're no longer allowed to use randomization. Oops. So what we do instead is make use of a class of stateful deterministic schemes, which we call unique ciphertext schemes. And a unique ciphertext scheme is very simple. The definition is basically that for every key, every message, and every associated data, and every possible state tau of the decryption algorithm, there's at most one ciphertext C that decrypts to that particular message M under K for that state. 
And here's uh, the main constructive theorem that we have, very simple to state. Let's take a unique ciphertext encryption scheme, pi, for any subversion of pi that is decryptable, so satisfies that condition that the encryptions under the subverted algorithm should decrypt correctly under D, then any surveillance advantage against such a scheme has zero advantage. Sorry, any surveillance adversary against such a scheme has zero advantage, no advantage whatsoever, which means we have ASA security. Let me give you very briefly the proof intuition for this. Here's the big brother adversary who is submitting uh, queries to its encryption oracle. We'll go for the single user setting to simplify things here. There's a, a, a general reduction to this case. So i is going to equal 0, meaning we're only dealing with one key. Um, we have, we're either in the b equals 1 world or the b equals 0 world. We get responses, c0 and c1, as our ciphertexts. And now we're going to, um, in theory, decrypt these ciphertexts to obtain two messages, m1 and m0, and associated states. And it's easy to see on the left-hand side that m1 must equal m by correctness of the encryption scheme. And it's also easy to see immediately from the decryptability condition that m0 must also equal m. Um, so now we know that m0 is equal to m1. And now if you look carefully what's going on here, we have the same message. We have the same key, the same associated data, and the same state. That then means by the unique ciphertext property that c0 must equal c1. Okay? We've removed all of the freedom to encrypt in some sense in this setting. And now if you look at the bit that's produced by the Big Brother adversary, this is just for one message, it extends to many messages, but if you look at this bit, well now the fact that C0 is equal to C1 means that B prime must be independent of B. So the ciphertext leaked nothing about the hidden bit B, which means the scheme is secure. So we would like to instantiate this, of course, and in fact this is relatively easy to do. If we start with something called a tidy non-space symmetric encryption scheme, where the definition of tidiness comes from the work of uh, Nam Prempre et al. from Eurocrypt this year, and we set the nonce now to be a counter in both the encryption and the decryption routine and make a doubly stateful scheme. And as long as we reject permanently whenever we encounter a decryption failure, then it's easy to show that this construction gives you a symmetric encryption scheme with unique ciphertexts. And now you just apply the previous theorem, and you're done. And this can be instantiated very efficiently using standard schemes. OK, now I'm going to come to the concluding remarks. So we've initiated the formal study of algorithm substitution attacks, which is a, a very particular class of attacks against symmetric, symmetric encryption schemes. We think it's an important class of attacks that has been understudied until now. Our work highlights what we call the danger of choice. So in our context, non-determinism or randomization is actually bad for security. And this is interesting to compare to one of the kind of fundamental principles of networking called Postel's principle, or the Postel robustness principle, that says you should always be very conservative about what you send in a network protocol, but be very liberal in what you accept. And here, liberality, being liberal is a bad thing. Being liberal gets you into trouble. So um, I want to emphasize that these are just one vector by which mass surveillance attacks might be carried out against encrypted communications. And we therefore encourage everybody to you know, talk to us at the break, talk about what other research problems we might try to study here and make, make a difference in this particular area of cryptography. So our work really...